I'm Lara Matosian, host of the Jason Possible podcast. The Jason Possible is a kind of shadow future, hovering on the edges of the present state of things, a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. This podcast is all about probing what's possible, what's probable, and what's preferable in education. Join us as we explore how we can overhaul our current pedagogical systems, solve global grand challenges, and bring about civilization-level change. The Adjacent Possible podcast is held in partnership with Area 2071, which is part of the Dubai Future Foundation. The Adjacent Possible podcast is also supported by Academy, a global educational organization that offers future-focused and wisdom-based education to high school learners with the aim of preparing them for a world of automation, artificial intelligence, and accelerating change. Our guest today is Norm Dean. Welcome to the Adjacent Possible podcast. You join me, your host, Lara Matosian, and our guest, Norm Dean, Chief Education Officer at Talim. Norm, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. You've been a teacher, principal, curriculum consultant, statewide policy manager, school superintendent, and assistant regional director. What inspired you to focus on the education space? Um, Interesting question. Uh, When I was a, uh, a child, I went to a local government school in my hometown of Melbourne and it was a uh, very much a working class uh, area and uh, my own parents hadn't completed their own formal education but they they were impressed upon me the importance of doing that so when I went through my schooling I was uh, committed to finishing schooling in whatever that was going to mean I didn't know at the time but in about my teenage years I developed a great love for literature and I went to a uh, technical school, which in those days would be like a, uh, an institution where you were to become a, a, uh, a carpenter or a, or a f- uh, machinist or something of that ilk. Um, I went to that kind of a school because that's the kind of school my father had gone to, so he thought his son should go there. Uh, however, I developed a great love as I for literature, and um, at that time, when it came time to leave school and go on to university, I spoke to my guidance counselor at university, uh, at school rather, and said, you know, I, I love, I just love reading and literature and so on. Uh, and they said, oh, well, why don't you go and teach? And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And uh, then I thought about my own journey um, through schooling and thought it would be really nice to to give something back. Uh, and so that's why I pursued that, that course of, uh, of a career. At that point, I hadn't decided whether to become a secondary teacher and pursue the kind of literature uh, vein or become a primary teacher but I in talking with people discovered that with um, primary education there was a greater capacity for um, more areas of interest than being in a particular discipline stuck in that discipline you know mm-hmm. forevermore so in the end I, I chose uh, primary education and uh, and that's the course I pursued and and here I am and I've loved every single not every single moment but most <laughs> <laughs> most of the moments yeah uh, it's been fantastic yeah and could you tell us more about uh, your role as Chief Education Officer and a bit more about Talim? Sure. Uh, uh, Talim as a group have been uh, working here in the UAE for only about 12 years now. And uh, Talim as a group, we have uh, 10 international schools. And uh, we have those mainly in, well, I think nine are currently here in Dubai. We have one school in Abu Dhabi, Raha International School. Uh, other than that, they're all here in, in Dubai. And we provide a I think a high quality international education predominantly for expatriate children but we have large numbers of Emirati children in a number of our schools uh, and so therefore we have a wonderful I think capacity to um, give something back mm-hmm. to the country which is part of the, the rationale behind the founders of, of Talim, that's what they wish to do, was provide a quality education for the students in this nation and of course in, in the region particularly. So broadly that's that's to Liam, that's what we do. We have from kindergarten through to uh, you know age 18, we have three different curricular types, uh, US curriculum, uh, uh, British curriculum, and we have IB schools. So we have the three different curricular types, uh, all high quality schools providing what I think is really an outstanding education for the, the children in our, in our care. 
Um, so my role as, as Chief Education Officer is to take responsibility for the academic programs across all of those schools and to work closely with principals, obviously, to ensure that they are providing the necessary uh, learning and teaching of the right quality for the kids in our care. And also at the strategic level, uh, I work as a member of the uh, uh, Senior Executive Board where we make the, the more strategic decisions and direction for Talim as a group and make those uh, overarching decisions. So it's kind of a, a nice role I for me in that it's very much a uh, combination of a helicopter view, if you like, and the more um, strategic work and also the very much nuts and bolts working with principals and teachers in, at the school level and engaging with, with students. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good role in that way, actually. So hopefully um, imparting my own knowledge and expertise to assist others to do better, really. And what do you enjoy most about this role? What I enjoy most is is always, oh, there's two bits. One is when you go into a school, what you love about going into a school, if you've been a teacher, as I have, what you love is just talking with kids. You walk in the school and kids come up to you and begin conversation with you and begin to engage with you, which shows you, A, they've got confidence in themselves, confidence in who they are, and, and generally they've got such wonderful stories to tell. Uh, and so I love to go into schools and just, just talk with, with children. So that's a part of the job that I really, really love. The other part which I really enjoy, of course, is just, is, as I said before, is the mixture of those two things because it's really exciting to, to work at the, at the higher thinking level and think strategically about what you could do or what you might be able to assist to really make a difference at, at one level but also then see it come into practice. So you see things that become reality because of decisions that you've made. So that's, they're the kind of things I really do. And really it's a very much the, the day to day, just, you know, it's a lot of slog for all of us in all of our jobs. But I think for me in my job, it's those highlights of A, the kids and B, being involved in decisions which I then see implemented, which then make a difference for the better. You are also a treasurer of the Alliance for International Education. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about the Alliance and its mission. Uh, the Alliance for International Education is a uh, a group of people, of which I'm one obviously, that, uh, that have been in existence since 2002 and as a group we believe in uh, international mindedness and intercultural understanding and uh, so we, uh, we, every two years we gather together uh, groups of teachers from around the world and principals and educators and we have um, run a call really rigorous discussion, debate and dialogue. This coming year in fact will be in Geneva in October this coming year. Um, and we're, we, I think our, our theme this year is rethinking international education um, values and, and how we make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. So we come together from all different walks of uh, education. We have university professors, we have people like myself, we have some people with principals, uh, and we come together to have dialogue among ourselves, but more importantly to facilitate dialogue among, among other educators. Uh, and, and we challenge really um, uh, the status quo and we ask some, some genuine questions about are we heading in the right direction? And we ask some really serious questions about what does international mindedness really mean and what does intercultural understanding really mean? What does it mean in practice? And what does it mean in a school in the middle of uh, India or in the middle of Kenya as opposed to a school in downtown Dubai or, or, or somewhere else for that matter? So we do this in our own spare time. We don't get, <laughs> we don't get paid <laughs> for this. We do it in our own time, but we all believe very much in, in the notion of uh, a better world through dialogue and through um, really focusing on what we have more in common than what's, what's different about us, really. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, it's a free plug. The conference is on this, uh, this October, so yes, you can go to the website, you'll find information. Yeah, <laughs> Go for it. Tell yeah. us, uh, what's, what is the website? What website should we go uh, to? It's uh, www.aie, it's INTED, it isn't short for international, INTED, uh -huh. uh, alliance dot a, uh, dot org.com yeah. okay yeah. okay great um so through the plethora of experiences you've mm -hmm. had through the different roles in education experienced experienced yeah and through your work with the alliance what are some of the problems facing the education system today that's a good question and i'll tell you why it's a good question because an education system it, it means different things to different people in different places in the world um, because education is, um, is, is many things to many people. Uh, I interestingly, I did a Google search on um, meanings of, meaning of the meaning of life. 
meeting of the life. Now, the, <laughs> anoint, the, anoint, now, the 948 uh, million um, hits on, on what that means. Now, the meaning of education there is about 1 billion 800 million. Now, there was substantially more hits on, on uh, what does it mean to be, uh, what's the meaning of education and what's the meaning of life. The reason I'm saying that to you is because when people ask that question, they, and they do all the time, it's a good question, then I kind of have to contextualise it because I think, um, to me, it's like having a pointy end of an arrow and there are schools and systems that are at a pointy end of the arrow who are forging through and are creating change and doing things differently and, and really being quite innovative. Um, and then as the arrow goes back and it expands out, we have many schools and systems uh, where they're still catching up, still playing catch up. So it's not an even playing field in, in that sense. So the problems or the challenges, I think, uh, are clearly many, many fold. In the world today, there are clearly many challenges for all of us, actually. But um, the pace of change is probably the not not a, not a surprise, I guess. The pace of change for education systems and schools is is a great challenge because it's you know the whole advent of uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality and and all the things that come with that and with technology. Um, is difficult to keep abreast of that, and in fact, you can't really. So, what we have to do is is rethink how we work with our children and what skills and attitudes our children need to enable them to cope with the demands that are ahead of us that none of us can really be certain about. So, a general response to your question would be: I think in many industries and ours is no different. It's just the, it's just the pace of change uh, that is just and the the pace of what it looks like to be in a community any longer anyway. What is a community and how we define a community and how does a school serve a community? I think these are really great challenges for all of us, quite frankly. A and another one, is, though it seems simple but it's complex, is just the design of a school, for example, because traditionally we still build schools like boxes, right? Classrooms are still boxes. Well, the world is not, not really composed of boxes any longer. Yes. Right? Okay. So we, we need to quite radically rethink how we facilitate a learning experience in a way which is no longer sit and listen in a row and just do as I tell you to do. That's just not the world any longer, quite frankly. And part of that, if I, if I can kind of digress a bit, part of it is also about then how we work with and educate our communities. Yes. Because mum, dad and the grandparents... And um, all have in their mind what their school was like and therefore I expect my son or daughter will be have a similar kind of experience mm -hmm. and of course it isn't like that any longer. So how we can engage them, engage community, um, is an ongoing, mm. an ongoing challenge for us all. Like most of the Global Grand Challenges, it is multi-layered. Oh yeah, it is. It's, it's very multi-layered, very complex, yeah. You mentioned that uh, at the tip of the arrow are schools that are innovating faster mm. than others. Can you give us some examples out of your experience in ways that these schools have been able to keep up with the pace of change more than other schools? What you think were the reasons behind their being able to keep up? Uh, yeah, well, without, name, uh, without naming any individual schools, there are, s there are schools that are actually uh, already putting into practice some of the things that we're already talking about here in the KHCA, for example, mm. it talks about having schools where children uh, don't necessarily come into school every day and they might have their schooling off-site in another location. It could be a work location, it could be another training institution, it could be another, a different environment altogether. Um, so there are schools that actually um, that actually do that. There are schools mm -hmm. where children don't come into the formal school every day mm -hmm. because they are pursuing other areas of learning which will add to their experience and add to their knowledge base. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and they use technology to do that, but they use other things to do that as well. But the challenge, of course, is always how we how we monitor those things, how we ensure that we we have quality control over those things, how do we quantify when it comes to um, university entrance, those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, so, but to get to uh, back to your question, so where the schools have got the you know the point the edge is really about I think two things. One is about using the technology, which is a driver. But technology in the end is still a tool that yes. teachers use, right? It's just always a tool. what I say too. Yep. So it's not the be all end, not at all. So we've got to re we do have to remember that actually it is it is a tool that people use. Um, so I think to me it's more about providing opportunities and experiences for children that take them out of the confines of a classroom or learning environment and put them in a real life situation where they can apply the learning. Agreed. So we all do that to varying degrees. We might send the kids off 
you know, to the market to spend money or whatever, whatever. Um, but uh, quite conscious and deliberate learning experiences that is applicable to real life and real problem solving and real creative thinking. I, mean, I think these are the kind of things that schools need to be thinking more about how mm -hmm. they do those those kind of things for, mm -hmm. for children mm -hmm. because that's what's ahead of us, quite mm -hmm. frankly, and it's here now. And mm -hmm. But it's what's going to come more and more, I think, quite frankly. Mm. Agreed, completely agreed. And so uh, touching upon you uh, mentioning earlier about involving the community, the parents, mm. the grandparents, um, in, in learning how to change, really, with the times, how can we inspire them to do that? How can we inspire these stakeholders to change? Uh, I think we have to communicate a need. I mean, because it's, it's again, no great secret that all of us are all the same. Human beings are very reluctant to change, t typically, um, unless they see a need. Now, sometimes a need comes because you have no choice. You're forced to do something, uh, and therefore you have to change the course of action. So you but what's the most successful is when people can see a change that will make things better, and they can then buy into that. So I think a lot of it is, is actually really uh, engaging engaging community in meaningful collaboration in meaningful ways and and having joint projects which involve mums and dads and grandparents and the community not just coming to my school i'm going to show you something for now and you go home again but actually coming in working on projects which are going to have a real a real manifest impact on the on the community so those i think those kind of activities will really have engage people the other thing is I think we need to be very mindful of the the cultural context in which we all live and work and operate. So in other words, it's it's superficial and I think arrogant of me to come into any community, Arab or otherwise, and just say, here, this is the model I've used in another country, use this one. Because it's completely devoid of a cultural context and understanding. So part one of your, or, or to answer your question, part one is actually to deeply understand the culture in which in which you operate. And then as a good teacher would do, you take you take the learner from where they are on the journey. You, no point starting ahead of somebody; you've got to get them to, to where they are. So I think having um, having dialogue and having action and having partnerships and and building on uh, on successes is really really important. And sharing those successes. Um, and the other thing is is to institute a kind of culture of no f of no failure, no failure, because what holds people back is the fear of failure. And if this goes wrong, what does that look like for me and my mm -hmm. family and so on and so on? So I think we need to provide and create safe um, safe environments for people to test to test things out. And in this country particularly, I mean, Sheikh Mohammed has on many occasions um, espoused, I think, some wonderful vision for, for education. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, in, this in this country at least, we do have, I think, a, a a catalyst for the change. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed's made it very clear. Yes. The fact that we're sitting in this place yes, here today, here, right? Twenty seventy one. Okay. Very, yeah. very clear. So I think we can we can use that as leverage with the Emirati community mm -hmm. uh, to help them understand the, the journey that this country is on and how they can contribute to that. Um, and secondly, because our our communities, almost invariably the Talim communities at least, are very mixed mixed cultural communities then that to me is a wonderful opportunity to really um, mm. develop and embrace the capacity of all of us together as a community can make a difference. But you have to be intentional about that and we can't just think it'll happen because it won't because people have busy lives and they do other things and I, and I completely understand that. So, um, But I think we need to be very deliberate and, uh, and and make a genuine effort to engage our communities and this may take time but we've got to start the mm -hmm. journey otherwise we just get further and further behind that. How much of this do you see happening in the schools today? I see it happening. Um, I see it happening quite a lot. But what I also see is um, is uh, er areas we can improve and do and do better. Because I think, like you know, all schools, we would delude ourselves if we thought that every parent's going to come along and love what we do. Because I don't. That's that's life, and that's that's how it is. So what we have to do, and and we do, is actually c continue to look for new and different ways to engage. Um, with with all of the community because people are busy. It's a busy life. Okay, everyone's frantic. They've got family to go home to. They've got businesses to run. They've got sports to go to, and, and so on and so on. So it's in that kind of uh, that, that kind of context we have to understand to then engage with our community in a meaningful way, and I'm not just superficially, but in a meaningful way. We have to find some leverage somewhere. So I think our schools do this very well, but there are parts we can do even better. We want to. 
to do better. So we continue to search for what are the gaps and how can we engage parents and, and make it a, a part of, a, a just a part of who we are and the ethos of, of the school. The other thing I think is also to, to expand the, the notion of what is a community because a community is made up of all sorts of people and businesses and, and groups. Of so it's not just the school and the parents. It's the school and the parents and a whole lot of other people uh, and bringing them in. So years ago, I worked on a project um, uh, at home where we, we built schools and we built community centres alongside them. We built medical centres alongside them. Uh, and it was a, so it was a place where a a parent could come and effectively do whatever the parent needed to do for the day with their children in, in terms of it was medical or in terms of schooling, in terms of uh, libraries, in terms of community, whatever it was, but make it the hub mm -hmm. because then people come to you and they come to you for a purpose and you're not a school stuck out here somewhere and everybody else is over there somewhere. We need to kind of be mm -hmm. more integrated, I think, in in how we do that. A and to go back to a comment I made earlier about design, mm -hmm. um, yes. it's not only design the building, but design the, the flow of people. Mm -hmm. Because if you can, des if you can design, a sh and, sh and supermarkets do this brilliantly, <laughs> they actually make sure we go down certain roads to put certain things, right? So I think if, if uh, in, c in constructing educational precincts, for example, if we can look at the flow of where people go, uh, and the time of day and night that can happen and be very open and creative about that, we can, we can actually create and facilitate some wonderful areas of engagement, actually. So that also involves even more stakeholders. You're talking about wider city planning. Yes, I am, yeah. Yeah, because again, otherwise, you're right, you, you can't, schools can't do it in isolation, obviously, so city planners need to, I think, uh, and in some cases that's happened, and I've worked on some of these projects previously, uh, where we sit down to plan a community and we actually look at how we integrate that whole community and what's in the hub is the, is the school, mm -hmm. but what we build around that is, is the infrastructure to feed in, into that. Because once upon a time, um, in fact, you know, I started teaching, I had a one teacher school, right? Just one teacher, me, and, and my school. And my school was the centre of everything, the centre of the universe for that community because that was it. So it, it, it was, and it was a true sense of community because everything happened there now you know over the years for all sorts of reasons that's that's changed but mm -hmm. i think we need to bring it back and particularly with the way of technology today we can if we're not careful sit in our homes and do everything without moving out of our lounge room mm -hmm. right you can remote control everything <laughs> you can true. cook your dinner before you can, you can open the car you can turn the car on you can you can now get a driver's car to go and do your shopping for you can, you can mm -hmm. stay at home and not to go anywhere mm -hmm. so i think we have to be a bit more um very intentional about how we get people engaging, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. so, so you've touched on um, some of the changes yep. uh, that you've seen. What changes would you like to see? Those that I've just described are, are the ones I would like to see um, because I think, well, I'll take, a, I'll take another tack to that. If I were to look at a global, to answer your question globally, what I'd like to see is a closing of the gap. Mm -hmm. This is the, the social equality person in me, right? Because there are many parts, many places in the world today where children do not get the opportunities that the children, for example, in Dubai get in mm -hmm. terms of their educational opportunity. So what would I like to see? I'd like to see, um, idealistically, a world where every child has every equal opportunity to actually get a, a, an education which would enable them to make uh, become productive um, members of society, quite frankly. Um, in terms of the current, I suppose, the world in which I live here, what I'd like to see would be more collaboration and more interaction and more opportunity for children to be creative outside the school confines and engaging more broadly with other communities and other other institutions. Mm -hmm. And again, we do, we do that to a certain extent. All international schools all do reach out to, to various communities in various ways to various projects, but um, I'd like to see us be do that more, more uh, uh, differently and more creatively and more intentionally. And um, also that, that we have partnerships with universities and partnerships with uh, regulators and partnerships with all people who are part of the education um, regime who work together toward a common end. I think at the moment, mm. no, nobody's folding particularly, it's just history mm, yes. happens, right, okay? And so we are very 
isolated and yes. we have little silos everywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if we could break some of those silos in, I think it would make a huge, huge difference, mm. actually. It would be more holistic. Yeah, far more holistic. Interesting. I went to a conference in London the week before last um, with uh, 10 universities from around the world and myself and well, the 10 educators, including myself. And we had uh, three days of dialogue around how can we break down those barriers um, that exist between us. And again, it's not anybody's doing it deliberately, mm. but the way things have grown up, we've just grown further and further apart. So it, it was a really robust and interesting and challenging uh, three days, really, to, to think how we can pull back and, and trying to turn some of that around. Um, but the world, you know, operates mm -hmm. so much in silos and mm -hmm. it's such a, yes. I think, such a pity because we, we our life is not like that. No, mm, yeah. no part of life is like that, yeah. actually. And in your experience, how open are schools to change? Uh, <laughs> 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 for our listeners i just want to say that he just took a little bit of a seat he seat, he sat himself a little bit more up <laughs> you, see, you can't no. see that but i did yeah <laughs> so because it, because because a lot of this a lot of this is is dependent upon how open the community is to change mm -hmm. so it's the old chicken and egg uh, syndrome it's a very interesting one to be honest because if you want a school to leave out the front if again i'm circling back to where i was before but um a school can only do that if it can bring its the people with it, uh, because there's no well, no, that's not no point. It's difficult to get to a place as a school if your community don't understand where you are. So, so what do you do if it's a chicken and egg situation? Okay. Like, well how do you I resolve this? No, no, then I how think do you tackle the challenge? Okay, I think we do. I think we in education um, have to be uh, courageous enough, to be honest with you, to have these conversations back with our, with, our, with our communities and with other uh, uh, other people in, uh, as I said before, other providers and other um, players in the game. Um, because if, if we don't, then I think we, A, we let opportunities slide. B, we're not being honest to the students in terms of what we need them to be have as skill sets moving forward into the future. And I don't, would hate to finish my career and say, well, I had a good career, but I was so safe, I never made one mistake in my life or I never made any difference. I mean, what mm -hmm. is the point of the career, quite frankly? <laughs> so, answer your question. Um, I think schools are very willing to make the change. In fact, every principal ever appointed goes into a school thinking he and she uh, want to actually make a difference and take the place to a school to a better place. Um, what we have to do, and in people, even people in my position, actually, is clear a path for them and say, go take the school where you need the school to go and b bring the people with you as best you can. And if you can't bring them all, so be it, because you can't bring them all all the time. Um, so that, that requires a very uh, a, a sense of vision about where the future is going and, and as unknown as it is, what might it be? What might we need to provide for students? And it also raises the question about teaching and the quality of teaching and the quality of teachers. Again, because a principal can only go where a principal can only go if he, has, he or she has the teachers to actually implement those things. So it's a then a complex question, but I think to answer your question, uh, I think schools have always been ready to, to to push out. I think they always have. And if you look back over uh, over time, over history, you'll always see schools, it's always uneven, but schools are pushing forward in various ways. And I think that's how a lot of change uh, comes about. But you need you need catalysts and you need champions and you need you need people who are really convinced of their own ideals and their own belief systems to, to do that. And that's not always easy, but I think that's what we need to, to do, really. Uh, again, o otherwise we we just play, we play catch up. It's almost like we, we clean up behind the world. And I think I think we should be doing it the other way around. You know, one of the most exciting things for me recently has seen this movement of those young children across the world for global climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> taking a day off school and getting and good for them i say good for them because this is the kind of thing we would want to see in, in our children we want to see them being risk takers we want to see them having a social conscience and taking some action and saying yeah i'm going to stand up to be counted and i'll stand up mm -hmm. for what i believe in so um good for them i'm glad you mentioned students because my next question was going to be how involved are the students in driving these changes oh, i think they're very involved you know the, the kids today are incredibly incredibly articulate, incredibly aware, incredibly smart, and uh, and they know a whole lot more than we ever did at our age, quite well, for 
from my age, I can tell you. And um, so they are, I think they are, again, the, the, the catalyst for the change because, mm -hmm. they, you know, they will ask questions that I would never even thought of. They ask questions and they, they want answers. And, and they, have, they have access now to resources that can give them information in a, in a split second mm -hmm. that they can read mm -hmm. and that they can discern or they can query or they can ask or they can draw assumptions about. So uh, they, whether we like it or not, they're, they're going to keep pushing us on mm -hmm. because they are generating ideas, they mm -hmm. are generating questions, mm -hmm. they are generating thoughts, they are generating needs uh, that, that we have to address. Mm -hmm. So I think kids... Um, I mean, they, they are the catalyst. Mm -hmm. They are the catalyst for change. Uh, even when they're even when they're young now, because no matter what age, they are exposed to a very different world yes. and and visual stimulus, and and they hear things, they see things, and so they bring to school with them these these ideas into mm -hmm. into the fulcrum of a mm -hmm. of a classroom. Um, so yeah, they drive. And of course now, as they get older into their teenage years, and they have much greater capacity to um, to engage and to engineer and to and to to influence themselves, so yeah, I think it's it's exciting, and and, and it's, it's you know it's, it has flipped. It really has flipped because once upon a time, uh, when we went to school, the teacher and even the adults in the room were the ones that had the knowledge, and the children mm -hmm. soaked it up. And, and now it's 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 the opposite. They don't right? need the adults in the room for more than guidance. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So what can we do? Uh, how can we involve our students more? in taking their education in their own hands. Because as you say, they have knowledge at the tip of their fingers. Mm -hmm. They don't need the educators to deliver this knowledge to them anymore. How can we how can we empower them more to be in charge of their education? I think we need to uh, I think we need to guide them. I think we need to contextualize a lot of things for them. And I think we need to provide them with a safe place to to explore and to learn. Um, and because being Having knowledge and being exposed to knowledge is not the same as learning. Uh, there is a difference. And so I think the teacher today has a great responsibility um, to actually help process the experiences and the knowledge into a learning experience and making it meaningful and, and helping also um, with children understanding um, their, own, their own place in that. Um, and I think, for example, a great, a great responsibility on student well-being is, is, a, is, a, is a huge. It's a huge issue, I think, in the world today. And so for teachers to be uh, attuned to that and, um, and aware of individual students and where, they're, where they are at in their emotional maturity in, in terms of can they understand what they've just read or understand what they've just heard, can they actually understand the, the concepts, that's one thing. The other thing for the teacher is, I think, to make far more interconnected the learning experiences of a, of a child so it's not like you finish my maths lesson okay forget that now go into science lesson and there's been no relationship well no that's that's a false dichotomy completely and utterly. Yes. So, so every teacher is a teacher of knowledge every teacher is a teacher of skills some have some particular knowledge base different to others but w together we have to kind of put the picture mm -hmm. together so that's where schools in terms of just their their planning and their curriculum mapping and just some of the kind of what you might think is a mundane kind of task are not mundane at all because they actually have to scaffold learning mm -hmm. and build a, an environment where children will learn in ways which are meaningful to them and can actually make make difference and make sense of the world around them. And that, again, go back to myself, come back to mum and dad and the parents, mm -hmm. when you go home and we have, as a child, have these conversations with parents, uh, it's really important that we're all on the same page here, that we understand what we're all we're all hoping to get for the child. So, um, to me, that that r the role of the teacher has changed, yes. but, it's, but it's but it's equally, I think, equally as important as it ever was. Quite frankly, of course, it's very challenging. And um, what should school curricula look like today? What should they focus on? Uh, how can we make a curricula adaptable to meet the changing demands of today? And the future. Okay, uh, uh, you know, curricula is one of those things where, it, again, if you ask ten people how they would define the word curricula, you're probably going to get ten different interpretations. My interpretation of it is that whatever happens in a school during a day is curriculum. Uh, the child's experience is a curriculum experience. Uh, that sometimes is a is a planned experience. Sometimes is an unplanned experience. Um, so, 
what we need to do is actually have a curriculum that has at its core um, essential learning. Mm. And then beyond that, it has a whole range of other things which add to that essential learning. So, for example, it's important that every child clearly has the capacity to read, to write, know their, their numeracy, their math skills, et cetera, et cetera, their science. So there's a core body of knowledge. Uh, it's like building a house, quite frankly. Get the foundation, then I can build. Now, what I build might be completely different to somebody else, but I have to have the core knowledge. So I think there is a core base of knowledge. It's always been the case since... Socrates, quite frankly, there's always been a core body of knowledge, and that core body of knowledge is really, really important because from that you can then build other things. So, the curriculum, um, to me, is a kind of spiral in that it, it starts out with the core knowledge, which then, as a child grows and develops and matures, and this is not necessarily by grade level because children all grow and develop yes. at different stages, right? So, as I am is as I need, and so as that happens, we build upon that that knowledge base. And, and once secure in that knowledge space, I say, okay, you're, you're fine here, so stay there for a minute and let's go off on some tangents somewhere. Let's go off in some different directions and let's pose some challenges that you don't know answers to, uh, but use the root knowledge that you have to explore and to find or extrapolate or even identify or, or, or test out or just see where this takes you, okay? But you've got the core body of, mm -hmm. body of knowledge. Um, and so, but beyond that, it needs to be, as I said before, very exploratory and very interconnected, and not not in isolated yeah. isolated ways any longer. And and hence the articulation throughout the school, but then on to the university becomes yes. critical. Okay, because what we find happens at, at transition points is that there sometimes can be a regression because we go back to where oh, let me take you back, my kids. Mm -hmm. well, we've been, done this a hundred times mm -hmm. before, Miss. I don't want to go there anymore. But, but we take them back, so um, we need to be able to not do that. Yes. We need to build on those skill sets. So let's go to Talim uh, with this question. What goals for innovation do you have for Talim? Um, any plans over the coming years? How, any transformations uh, going towards innovation at Talim? Interesting you should ask the question because this just this past week I've been... Uh, I've been thinking about um, uh, next year, obviously, and, and the direction we want to go and the priorities that we want to mm -hmm. pursue. And innovation is one of them that I identified it to me as being a key, a key driver for mm -hmm. next for next year, mm -hmm. because um, our schools have done, I think, some really excellent work. But I don't, from my point of view, I haven't been. I've only been here just less than a year now, so I'm still kind of learning the ropes a bit. Um, it's a bit what I would call uneven. So schools have done things exceptionally well, but not necessarily. In, a, in as cohesive a manner as I would like to see it. Mm -hmm. We did have in March a, uh, a, a STEAM day where all of the Tulliam schools came together and it was really, really fantastic uh, because the kids created some amazing things. It was really, really fantastic. So I, I'd like next year to build on that uh, more, more con cohesively as an organisation mm -hmm. and look at how we can um, be more innovative. Now, not just in the curriculum program but I think in actually how the ways in which we work um, with each other and the ways in which we might work with different agencies and even mm -hmm. with different schools and mm -hmm. different groups of people so I'd like us to take innovation very broadly mm -hmm. and not just think of it oh well it's just going to be innovation in terms of some curriculum mm -hmm. initiative that's great mm -hmm. but in terms of can we teach more quite differently and radically mm -hmm. in some ways can we actually partner with people differently innovatively mm -hmm. in some ways uh, what are some different ways we can look at our at different structures, for mm -hmm. example? Um, what are the ways we can structure the school day? Can we actually look at how we structure the school day, for example, uh, differently? Can we look at how we structure um, the, the times and the ways in which we meet, the ways in which we plan, our professional development? Um, so uh, take mm -hmm. innovation more holistically mm -hmm. than just a kind of a singular mm -hmm. curriculum track, but mm -hmm. a more holistic view of the organisation because we need to be kind of dynamic. Mm -hmm. And one of my favourite words I is nimble. I think mm -hmm. we need to be nimble in the times, okay, yes. because the world is changing so rapidly and we yes. need to change with that. Um, but we need to be ready and, and prepared to jump when we need to. What really interested me just now was when we said innovation, you very quickly said STEAM. So for our listeners, could you tell us what STEAM is? Science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. And how is that different from STEM? And why is STEAM uh, put together in the same sentence with innovation and not STEM? Because the A is for arts, okay? And this to me is wonderfully and significantly important. Um, 
I'll give you a little anecdote. I was at a, at a conference a year ago and uh, a person was speaking all about the science and the maths and, and technology and all the things that were going to you know going to happen in the world. Um, and then spoke about some assessment, some assessment rubrics and so on. And at the end of the meeting, I said to this person, um, I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. I said, if my name was Michelangelo, mm -hmm. uh, I said, I don't think I fit in what you're <laughs> describing here. <laughs> now, it was a kind of a cheeky <laughs> question, but I made the point uh, because... I like cheeky questions. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> that was my, this was my whole point that, you know, the course of science and technology, of course, that's really, really important. We know that. But equally so to me of the arts, because what is what is life without the arts, and what is humanity without the arts? And the arts lend themselves so beautifully to other aspects of, of, of technology. I mean, the arts, the maths, the science, uh, the technology, everything can build into the arts. And so yes. the reason the AU's STEM became STEAM uh, was probably a lot of people like me were agitating around the world because the arts got, got dipped out. But I think it, you know, I can't be flippant about it, but to be serious about it, I think the arts is an integral part of of all of the other aspects of learning because uh, to separate that to me is very very artificial mm. uh, and yes yeah, steam we use it's kind of an acronym it's easy to remember so we kind of throw yes. it in but you know mm. you can kind of unpick it into all the various yeah. elements then it becomes a far more complex beast yes. than, than obviously just saying yes. it like that but you know the the creativity um the creativity part, I think, is, is really important yes. to me. And there's a wonderful YouTube, and I'm sure every educator in the world has seen this by you know, Ken Robinson. Yes, Courtney. of course. Okay. I just love that. I love it because it challenges our very essence about yes. what we do in, yes. in education. And and so, you know, the creativity part is... is now, whether it's a maths problem, a science yes. problem, an art, whatever, yes. the creativity bit is just beautiful. And to say to children, have a go. Try yeah. it out. Test it out. Dream up something. I mean, that to me is very, very powerful, quite frankly. So moving towards the end of our podcast. Already? Uh, yeah, already? already. Can you imagine? Time has flown. Well, I just got started. <laughs> uh, tell us about your vision for the future of education. My vision for the future of education is one where we actually seamlessly move from one place to another, engaging with people in really creative and innovative ways, learning and sharing. Now... That can sometimes be in a building. Mm -hmm. It can sometimes be online in a safe online place. It can sometimes be in a coffee shop. I think, to me, uh, the vision of the future is education becomes not a place but a, but a word that is about learning and exploring life. So mm. I think to try and decouple mm. education is just being about going somewhere. I like it's that. It's actually about experiencing something. Now, mm. I know that's a kind of very amorphous kind of vision for the future, but... That's how I see it. I'd love to think in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, we're no longer controlled by bells and, um, and, like and all sorts of other we have bureaucratic now, yes. things around us, but it's far more what it ought to be, that is like experiencing life and learning from life and, and giving back. And, uh, you know, the wor we know, it's not we don't know, what we do know is that the world will be very different. And so we have to change what we do or how we do it mm -hmm. and why we do it. Absolutely. I always like to end the podcast with this question. Mm. Norm, yes. what are you optimistic about? Uh, I'm optimistic about life, and I'll tell you why I'm optimistic about life um, very quickly. One, because I'm an optimist by nature, and I think if you're an educator, that's a, that's a, a lovely trait to have. Number two, um, history's on my side. We're still here, right? And, uh, and number three, <laughs> number three is that every day I, I see new things, I read new things that are exciting things. And so I think it's about your paradigm and how you view the world. And I could find many things clearly that are troubling, but gosh, there's so many amazing things, so many amazing advances just in, in, in technology and in the way people are developing. And I just think there's so much to be excited about, quite frankly, and it's great to be part of it. Thank well, you. Norm, time has flown. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it.